from New York City. For our viewers worldwide, I'm Danny Berger. In for Jonathan Farrow, it's the hangover after the NVIDIA party with futures tepidly higher. The countdown to the, clo to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Coming up, the equity rally takes a breather after its best day in over a year. NVIDIA keeps moving higher as it closes in on a $2 trillion market cap. And Goldman pushing back its date for rate cuts as the Fed stays on message. We begin with the big issue, record highs around the world. The stock's making new record highs. All-time highs. All-time highs. The equity market sort of really nicely sort of set up from here. Let's not get carried away. At the end of the day, the market is narrow. A little bit too narrow. A narrow market to those companies that have above average growth. You've got 40, 50 percent earnings growth coming from Tech, Tech Plus. What we are really looking for is uh, I I I for the rally to uh, widen out. Whether NVIDIA's leadership can kind of carry tech beyond just a, a one day game. If we can get <clears throat> maybe NVIDIA as a lever to help us widen out that breath into other industries. This tidal wave of spend, it's coming to the rest of tech. And in our opinion, that's going to continue to fuel this tech bull market. I have this feeling that within the next day or two, everyone's going to be like, okay, so what's the next catalyst? What takes us higher? Well, it's Magnificent One, and it got us to record highs. Joining us now to discuss is J.P. Morgan's Mara Pandit and Evan Brown of UBS. Mara, here we stand, record highs across global markets, not just here in the U.S. So what do you do now? Do you buy more? Do you sell some, take some profit, or just hang around on the sidelines? We're seeing all-time highs not just in the U.S. on multiple indices, but also in Japan, in Germany, in France. And what we have seen over history is that just because you reach an all-time high doesn't mean you're buying at the top. Often we see these all-time highs cluster in a given year, and that's already been the case year to date where today's all-time high could be uh, surpassed easily next week. So it's not a time necessarily for investors to be too worried about that because we still do have macro drivers like the economy with growth continuing to look strong. We've had six consecutive quarters of above trend growth, and we're probably tracking for another one. And earnings have gone from flat last year to positive this year. Now, essentially, the earnings growth story is expected to broaden out, and that should hopefully translate to the rest of the market. But I, I wouldn't fear the all-time highs from an investment perspective. Evan, what say you? Do you fear the all-time highs? Don't fear all-time highs, but we are taking some <laughs> chips off the table just because of it, it's been an exceptional run, and there are just really no no bears left, right? We've been overweight equities for for a while on this idea of this soft landing gaining momentum, and you've gotten data that's been pretty much as good as it gets. Um, now, any kind of change in that narrative, whether it's uh, you know inflation coming in a little bit too hot, too sticky, and, and the Fed having to, to pull back a little bit. That, that's a, a risk that we're a little bit concerned about. Um, but any any real threat there after this run, we just think the risk reward is, is a lot more balanced given where positioning and sentiment is. So Evan, you're lightening up. Where are you doing that? So we've been lightening up in, in U.S. equities um, and it, a, a little bit in EM as well. Um, but yeah, we've had we've had an exceptional run in U.S. equities. You know, certainly fundamentals have have supported it, but with valuations where they are at this point, um, you've got to think about risk reward. And, and so we've we've been taking down in the U.S. Mara, it, it is remarkable to see an all time high get there with a two percent gain. Usually when you're hitting all time highs, it's not that big of a gain because the exuberance is already there and you're just kind of creeping higher. What does it say to you that it's not only two percent? that got us there, but $277 billion in market cap added from one company alone. What do those kind of stats say to you? We have to think about what is driving some of those stocks higher. And what we have seen with the Magnificent Seven is that they continue to produce earnings and continue to grow into their valuations. And the earnings story is very important. If we think about this week in the macro versus micro battle, you had Fed minutes, you had uh, mega cap tech earnings. And what you saw was the, the earnings really stole the show and, and drove the market higher. What's important underneath the surface, though, is to think about that earnings contribution and where you're going to see drivers going forward. 
um, because I do think it's going to still come from earnings. But in the course of 2024, about 40% of earnings should come from the Magnificent Seven, relative to about 60% contribution from the rest of the market. And so I do think that broadening out and exposure is important. And we also have to remember that we've gone through so many names here. Magnificent Seven, sometimes people say Magnificent Six. <laughs> Once upon a time, they were the Fangs and the Fangma. Um, when we see these changes, it means the constituents are shifting, even just a little bit. So we have to be active when we think about these stocks because they're not all winners and they're not all winners to the same extent. So we really need to think about stock selection and balance here too. I mean, that, that is so true, but that's how this market works, right? We're gone from the days where Sears or, or what have you is the most big stock. But Mary, it's not even just getting away from tech right now. It seems that the sticking point is getting away from cash. Still this huge buildup in money market funds. How sticky is that? Does that come out of money markets and go into risk assets this year? It's going to be a little bit stickier than it has in the past, simply because you do see cash feeding inflation. You do see cash generating reasonable income. But let's put this in the context of the rest of the market and all the other asset classes out there. Because last year, you had a 5.1% gain in cash, the best year for cash since the year 2000. And yet pretty much every other asset class outperformed. So there is some long-term risk for investors here of shortfall feels safe in the moment, but over time, you're not growing your portfolio adequately and leaving a lot of opportunity on the table. But we have seen from flow data, you know, if you look back in the fall, you had more flows going into duration and then high yield coming into the year, Chinese equities, uh, small cap more recently. So you're certainly seeing investors willing to take on a bit more risk. Um, they just need to be mindful in the ways they do that. But I certainly think that's the right step in general um, out of cash, which is, again, a, a, an illusion of safety, really. Yeah, there's some Bank of America data on the small cap point that over the past week, small caps all their biggest inflow since June 2022. But you look at the screen now when it's a good day for equities. It's a mad day for small caps, Evan, because it is about big cap tech. It's about AI. What needs to change to make small caps loved again? Yeah, I think for, for small caps, you really need uh, lower rates. That's that's what we've seen. I mean, we've seen mega cap tech be impervious to, to higher rates because the earnings have been so strong, as Mira mentioned. But uh, but the small caps, uh, that correlation with rates is is still quite is still quite high. And so um, if you're starting to see rates really come down, of which we're we're skeptical, I mean, that keeps getting pushed out because the economy is strong. But a lot of these companies still are facing margin pressures and you know the the tightening of financial conditions that's coming from those higher rates is, is still feeding through into smaller companies to get small caps really outperforming we'll need to see something like what we saw in november and december which is a big move down in the 10-year yield and i just think inflation is too sticky for us to to see that in the coming months Evan Mira, we're going to take a pause right here because we have some breaking lines crossing the terminal on Russia sanctions. The U.S. has unveiled its biggest one-day sanctions package against Russia since the invasion of Ukraine two years ago. This list is targeting more than 500 people and entities. It's a fresh bid to squeeze the country's economy over the death of Alexei Navalny. It includes things like a military drone manufacturer, the top staff of that entity, different companies that specialize in things like printed plastics and numerous others. It's 90 companies that are also added to a list that limit their access to U.S. technology. We're going to have more on this throughout the hour, digging into the details and the impact of it. Now, meanwhile, traders, they are questioning whether that tech rally will broaden out to other sectors, as we were just talking about. But the rally has continued even as Fed rate cuts fade and the bets for them. Officials, we'd heard from them time and time again, they're pre preaching patience, warning against cutting rates too soon. Bloomberg's Michael McKee joins us now for more. And Mike, we've heard from a lot of Fed speakers this week. Yeah. Do, do you sing, Danny? I mean, do you sing around <laughs> the house? Well, we can all get together and sing from the Fed songbook because the words are pretty much all the same here that we've heard over the last uh, week or so. Yesterday, Jefferson Cook, Waller and Harker, sounds like a law firm, uh, all <laughs> saying the same thing, that we don't have to raise rates, uh, cut rates right now. So we're not going to. We're going to make sure by waiting a few more months. And everybody knows that that seems to be the plan now because uh, we have gone from the market pricing in six rate cuts in June, which uh, the Fed 
pushed back against, said that uh, they were only going to do three. And the market's come to the Fed. The market now believes that the Fed is right, and we've got three for each this year. The question is, when do they start? And we still don't know. Next week, we got, uh, Danny, a lot of uh, data, but not the data people really looking for. Uh, we've got new home sales, GDP revision. The PCE inflation numbers on Thursday are going to be key to the Fed because they want to see whether they're still making progress, although uh, this one report isn't going to change their mind about when they move. Jobs is not next Friday. Everybody always thinks it's the first Friday in March. It's not. Uh, it will be the following Friday. But there's plenty of Fed speak to make up for it. Boy, is there plenty of Fed speak to make up for it. We've got Schmidt, Barr, Bostic, Collins, Williams, Goolsby, Mester, uh, and Kugler uh, and Mary Daly all speaking next week. So if you haven't heard enough and you want to sing that chorus again, you'll have the opportunity. Oh, we get fed karaoke again next week. I can't wait, Mike, and can't wait to hear you repeat the songs for us. That's Bloomberg's Michael McKee. Now, after all that Fed speak, Goldman out with a quote this morning saying comments this week from Fed officials and the minutes of the January FOMC meeting suggest that the first rate cut is unlikely to come as early as our previous forecast of the May meeting. We continue to expect cuts in June, July, September and December for a total of four in 2024. Mara Pandit and Evan Brown are still with us. Mara, after this whole host of Fed speak, I love how Mike put it. They're all singing the, singing the same tune. Have you reconsidered when you think the Fed is going to move? This is the Fed's long engagement. Uh, they have committed to making cuts at some point, but they're reluctant to set a date. Coming into the year, we felt that the markets were a little bit too enthusiastic, pricing at a maximum at one point of 170 basis points of cuts this year. Um, but we have been in line with the Fed's expectations of three cuts starting later on. Uh, so we've been May, June, and now I think we're, we're certainly f more firmly into the June uh, territory. Uh, and I don't think it's unreasonable. Look, I think the Fed's pivot in December was pretty dramatic from higher for longer to considering cuts. And, and perhaps we could have heard a little bit more about patience at that point, um, because then it was the holidays and, and a dearth of data for a while. So markets were kind of scrambling to price in the right levels here. I do think it is a good thing now that markets and Fed expectations are essentially in alignment because hopefully what that means is, one, less volatility in the bond market going forward because there's a bit less room for a surprise from here on out, which should also translate well for the equity market. And two, when we think about where yields have gotten to, it's actually a pretty good entry point for duration. So from a positioning mm. standpoint, some, some favorable opportunities there as well. Mara, I love that you're not fighting the Fed because it's a lesson this market has to learn literally over and over again. Evan, it is remarkable how different participants in this market can look at the same data and the same Fed speak and come with drastically different conclusions. Fidelity's George F. Stopoulos is dumping nearly all of his Treasury holdings, saying he expects the U.S. economy to expand. Meanwhile, Jupiter has loaded up on Treasury, saying that they expect something of the magnitude of 400 basis points of rate cuts from the Fed. Where do you stand? That's the fun of, the, of being in the market as we debate <laughs> these different views. I mean, look, I think the Fed will end up delivering a few uh, rate cuts this year, but I just think that the the near term is is going to be a little bit tricky for for duration. In that, uh, we're seeing the economy show signs of acceleration, and the question has to be asked: like, is, is the Fed really restrictive enough? Right? We, we we've had. Uh, growth print after growth print coming strong. Consumer spending looks good. Uh, business and consumer confidence is improving. The good sector looks like it's it's bottoming out here. Housing, we talk about how high rates are. Housing is doing is doing pretty well and looks like it's going to contribute to growth this year. So the Fed has to be thinking, you know, uh, are we are we restrictive enough? Do we really need to be cutting rates this year? I know last time they said they're going to cut by seventy five basis points, but that's a moving target. They could move. It will just take two members of the FOMC to move their dots to have 50 basis points uh, uh, forecasted for this year. And so that kind of adjustment opens up the distribution of the market thinking, wait, are they are they actually going to mm. cut in the near term? Even if they end up doing so, um, we have to think about the sequencing here. And the data just looks too strong to be suggesting that they're doing aggressive easing in 2024. And look, as Mira was saying, the market has started to adjust to that. We've put in another 50 basis points higher for the basically for the front end of the curve and around that a little bit less for the tenure. But Evan, amid that, this equity market 
has not cared. I know we talked about the NVIDIA love fest that we saw so far this week or saw yesterday, but at what point, if at any point, does the equity market cave in to higher rates, especially as you're saying, duration still might be under pressure? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we've got a few more data points coming up. We've got a few weeks, but we, we'll have payrolls um, in, in a couple of weeks, and then we'll have the inflation uh, print um, for, for the February CPI. And actually, UBS is, is uh, well above expectations for the February inflation print that will come out in a few weeks. And so uh, coming at 40 basis points, if you get with the January print, which was very high, a, a second straight um, inflation print mm. that comes in quite high, that can really, really open up the distribution here and, and get people thinking, OK, wait, are they actually are they actually going to, to cut this year? And so um, as much as been as much as the equity market right. has held up and it's held up with good growth, good earnings, um, there's a big shift in mindset if you start to question whether there are going to be cuts at all. And then, you know, to the extreme, whether the Fed might even need yeah. to, to hike again, yeah, which you people could, think is crazy. You could look at the data but, of last week and say it was just one week, just CPI, PPI. That's not necessarily a trend yet. Mira, Evan, stick with us. Much more to, to discuss on that front. Let's first, though, take a look at the stocks that are moving ahead of the opening bell. With that is Abigail Doolittle. Hey, Abby. Hey, Danny. And before we do that, let's actually t check in on the commodity complex, because, of course, you were talking about those headlines earlier about the U.S. unveiling the biggest sanctions against uh, Russia since the war began. And, of course, for the war and also to send a message uh, around the death of Alexei Navalny. Uh, interestingly, as you mentioned, it targets 500 people and entities. But the U.S. is still not targeting uh, oil or their metals. Back in 2018, if you recall, they did actually impose sanctions against United Company Rusal, uh, but that's not the case right now. So we interestingly have oil down. Brent crude, as you can see, some volatility on the day, but to the downside. So we're not seeing some sort of an upside bid on supply fears. Similar situation for aluminum, copper. Uh, some of the grains are slightly higher, uh, but not a lot of impact right now. But you can see the in, uh, volatility into that announcement and out of it. We'll be reporting on that all day. As for the movers on the open, Carvana absolutely posting, uh, 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 popping, I should say, after posting better EBITDA than expected, their forecast factors an improvement in earnings and units sold. But I would say, Danny, this is a short squeeze of 32% short interest. Block up 18%, not such a big short interest, uh, big gains there. And then NVIDIA, another up day after that monster rally for earnings and that blowout forecast. Ooh, the gains keep on coming. Abigail, thank you very much. Now, coming up, we're going to bring you part of Bloomberg's conversation with Bundesbank President ECB Governing Council member Joachim Nagel. This is Bloomberg. Bundesbank President and ECB Governing Council member Joachim Nagel warning against early rate cuts, preferring a gradual approach. He spoke with Bloomberg earlier. We shouldn't be too, let me say, too complacent and uh, coming to the conclusion that we should cut rates too early. I think we should wait for the data, and this is what we agreed in the Governing Council, and I'm still, I'm still waiting for the data that gave me the understanding that inflation will come down to 2 percent, that uh, not only the headline inflation, also core inflation is coming down to 2 percent. And then maybe there's the time to cut rates. But hmm. to speculate now, for me, it is too early. We talked to your colleague Robert Holzmann uh, yeah. today. He said that it's unlikely that the ECB will cut before the Federal Reserve does such a step. Is that your view as well? So it's um, what Robert Holzmann uh, said. So he's his opinion, I think, important to me is we are doing monetary policy uh, for the Eurozone. So I have to look what uh, the numbers tell me in the Eurozone and the Fed colleagues do what they think is, is, is uh, necessary to bring inflation down. So um, mm. this is the important story behind that. Another thing that observers have started to look at is at which uh, speed and how the easing campaign could unfold. So once interest rate cuts start, would you prefer a gradual process, meaning quarter point cuts at every meeting, or do you also see a possibility of moving in bigger steps, maybe taking pauses along the way? Have you thought about that? 
speculating again here, <laughs> but just not to give you here again not an answer. I, I, I try to do my best to bring it in a more let me say, theoretical understanding. I think when we're talking about financial markets, it's often better to do things like that in a credible manner. Mm -hmm. Not to being too, let me say, maybe over optimistic at the beginning or then doing less or maybe even more. I think a credible approach often in a theoretical understanding has a better outcome. Bundesbank President and ECB Governing Council Member Joachim Nagel speaking to Bloomberg earlier. Mira Pandan and Evan Brown are back with us. Mira, you heard there from the Governing Council Member, he alluded to an interview that Holtzman gave saying that they would cut after the Fed. The rest of them are pushing back on cuts, much like the Fed. Can you buy Europe duration given all of that? I think in reality, what we're likely to see is that the Fed and, and the ECB are likely to start cutting around the same time. European growth is just looking a little bit weaker. So we want to be mindful of that. I think the, the bigger implication, too, for U.S. investors is the fact that usually that in, interest rate differential go, governs how much the dollar comes down. You see the dollar come down when the Fed cuts. Perhaps we see a little bit mm. less of a drawdown in the dollar. Evan, do you think it's going to be a synchronized rate cut cycle? You know, to us, the, the exact timing of the rate cuts don't matter too much between Europe and the U.S. What matters is how much they both end up easing. That's that in the end is, is what's going to matter for the dollar. And we just see uh, Europe, you know, structurally, the economy is just much in much weaker position than, than the U.S. And ultimately, the ability for Europe's European growth to withstand rates um, is lower than uh, than in the U.S. So, um, you know, rate rate differentials going out two years are going to move in favor of the U.S. and we right. think that will uh, support the dollar. Yeah, it's like the opposite of that uh, inspirational saying. It's the destination, not the journey. Mira Panda and Evan Brown, thank you so much. Coming up, we're going to get your morning calls and later we're going to be talking to Gabelli Funds around the opening bell. This is Bloomberg. Time now for our morning calls. First up, UBS has downgraded Rivian to sell from a buy, cutting shares by two notches due to slowing demand. Next up, Citigroup upgrading Fox to buy. They say investors are underestimating the company's new sports streaming deal. Finally, Barclays upgrading DraftKings to overweight. They are growing increasingly bullish on its digital gaming outlook. Where after a day where we hit all-time highs across markets, we're continuing to add to them. Futures are tepidly higher this morning. Nothing crazy, but it's Don't Fight the Fed. We're going to talk to Gabelli's Chris Marenji next on Don't Fight NVIDIA. This is the countdown to the open. I'm Danny Berger in for Jonathan Farrow. We're moments away from the start of trading. And if you thought stocks couldn't climb any higher after yesterday's record across the board, here we are. We're up about a third of 1%. NASDAQ futures, S&P futures, even NVIDIA is higher yet again. Maybe we've underestimated just how much can be priced into this stock. Unfortunately for small caps, they are still down. They're not joining the party. When it comes to yields, those are also taking a breather. Bonds, not too much action today after hitting another year-to-date highs yesterday after Fed speaker after Fed speaker saying, be cautious when it comes to pricing in cuts. Your euro versus the dollar slightly stronger. We're headed on track for the dollar's first down week to start the year. NYMEX crude down lower by 2% after the U.S. unveiled more sanctions against Russia. Some nerves. What does it mean for global trade? We'll get into that later this hour, but $76.90 a barrel. Now, one stock to watch at the open. It is Carvana. The used car retailer's profit did top expectations in the final months of 2023. Abigail Doolittle has more. Hey, Abby. Hey, Danny. And the stock is absolutely soaring, up about 30%, heading to its best day since July of 2023. But let's put this move into context because this stock was down about 99% between its 2021 peak when it was several hundred dollars high to its 2022 trough at a single digit number on going concern fears and debt issues. Now up more than 1,300% 
off of that low into today. So I think that there's a lot of relief here that this company is still around, that they're performing well. EBITDA of $60 million, not a huge number, but better than the estimate of $58.6 million. Uh, uh, dollars. Looking past the fact that revenue was just a little bit light, and it's the forecast that investors like a lot too, suggesting an improvement for both earnings and the number of cars sold. I was mentioning that uh, the last year has been a, one of retrenchment and debt reduction. Cash burn is important to watch as well. In uh, interestingly and importantly, the company's gross profit per unit rose to more than $5,500 uh, from just above uh, $3,000 in 2022. So they are doing well there and showing through into that EBITDA. I mentioned before, though, there's something else going on here. There is a bear short interest of about 32%. So some of today's now 35% move. Well, some of that's a bear short squeeze, Danny. Yeah, a little bit of a squeeze to that flavor. Abby, appreciate it. Now, another big beat this morning coming from Block. The payments company exceeded expectations with both results and first quarter guidance. Katie Greifeld has more. Hey, Katie. Hey, Danny. Uh, Block absolutely soaring after that beat and raise quarter. You look at cash as specifically revenue there rose 31 percent from a year earlier to 3.91 billion dollars that is topping estimates of 3.7 billion dollars and the big headline was that outlook the payments technology company raised its forecast for adjusted ebitda to at least 2.63 billion the previous guidance was 2.4 billion so a lot to get excited about there and you can see that in the sell side broadly positive on this report vital knowledge in particular calling out that the company has made significant significant progress on curbing costs and headcount. And remember, that's a particular focus for Block. They announced job cuts to cap the workforce at 12,000 employees. Uh, the firm aims to reach that goal by the end of the year. And we got some interesting comments from Jack Dorsey on the topic. He said that we're going to operate under this cap until we feel it's holding us back, which is likely years out, and continue to look critically at our organization and priorities. Traders clearly liking that discipline. Again, the stock up about 19% at the moment. Katie, appreciate it. Now, they can't all be good news stories, right? It's a different outcome this time for Warner Brothers Discovery. The entertainment conglomerate's revenue missed estimates. Sorry, Simone, you got the one stock that's not up double digits. Simone Foxman has more. No, not just not up double digits. It's actually hitting a record low here this morning after the company missing estimates. Revenue coming in at $10.3 billion. The expectation had been for $10.5 all of this mainly driven uh, based on misses in advertising revenue, down 14% year on year, especially in the company's TV decision uh, division, seeing a loss per share of 16 cents versus the six cents that was anticipated, feeling the impact of those recent writers and actors strikes. There actually were some good bits of news in here. Total subscribers surpassing estimates at 97 million, topping expectations on cash flow, and the company says it is on track for a one billion dollars of EBITDA in 2025 for its max streaming platform. Uh, in fact, David Zaslav, the CEO there, also talking about healthy traction in advertising uh, in the first quarter that they expect to continue over the near term. But the focus really is on the near term challenges. That's something that Deutsche Bank hi highlights Bloomberg Intelligence saying the company just has a $44 billion debt burden and that makes any M&A from here uh, very difficult. Do we see a floor today? Certainly negative the name of the game, though, with shares down now 12, over 12 percent, Danny. Simone, better luck next time. We'll get you a positive story <laughs> next week. Simone Foxman there. Now, we're also watching NVIDIA. It's in the green again. It's hitting a $2 trillion market cap. It had a record session yesterday, adding $277 billion in market value in a single day. That is bigger than the market cap of Netflix, of Pepsi, of Bank of America, just to name a few it is almost like a country on its own. Alex Webb joins us now for more on this. Alex, I mean, what's going on? It's up 4% again today after 16% yesterday. Yeah, it's quite astonishing to think that, you know, if it's just six years ago, we were writing about how Apple's the first trillion dollar market cap com company in the world. Now we've got four of them. We've got Apple, we've got Microsoft, got Saudi Aramco, and now Nvidia. The real thing yesterday, of course, we had the earnings. There was good news in the quarter that was being reported. There was good news in terms of the outlook, both of which massively exceeded the market's expectations. Perhaps, but perhaps more significant than that 
were the comments from the CEO, Jensen Huang, about 2024 and 2025. Because the company only forecasts one quarter in advance, that can sometimes create a little bit of skittishness among the investor community about how long this, this role can last, how long can they continue to grow at this extraordinary pace. Jensen Huang said that the growth trajectory is likely to continue at the similar level for the next year, 18 months. Uh, that is something clearly that provided a great deal of relief to investors and is one of the big factors driving this, this massive resurgence in the share price. And literally all the share prices with records across the board. Again, we are trading at another intraday record in the S&P right now. Alex, thank you so much. Now, Chris Morangi of Gabelli Funds weighing in on NVIDIA writing, AI is transformative in a way we can't predict. We're looking for businesses that can reduce costs and increase output using AI. NVIDIA, one of the clear winners, able to monetize the boom, which is why it added $250 billion in market cap. Don't fight it. I'm pleased to say that Chris joins us now. Chris, again, it's remarkable to see, again, $250 plus of market cap added on yesterday. It's up another 4% today. The thing is with this stock, it seems like investors we're caught off guard with how good the story is. We talk about regulators being behind on AI. Are investors behind on AI? Do we truly comprehend the potential of a company like NVIDIA? Well, we're, we're clearly in an in a era of enthusiasm. We're just beginning to um, think about the effects of AI. And there are very few ways to play it, uh, very few clear ways to play it. And, and NVIDIA is clearly um, among the best. And, and that's why it's why everybody, it's why everybody's jumping into this one. So. Um, a, lot, a lot of work to be done. I haven't attempted a, a DCF on NVIDIA, the market opportunity. Nobody knows how big it could possibly be, but um, it, it's early. And that's why uh, we're not fighting. We're not fighting. We don't own it, but not shorting it, certainly. When you do make that DCF on NVIDIA, please feel free to send it our way. I'd love, I'd love to see how you even attempt to do something like that. But, but given that, Chris, given it's, it's, it's again, you got to be creative in thinking what NVIDIA can do. What do you do after a day like yesterday? Do you try to buy up some NVIDIA? No, we don't. We, we, we're focused on our areas of core competency. That doesn't really include semis. Um, you know, we're, we're focused on industrials, consumer, um, in some areas of financials and, and healthcare. And we're looking for companies that have uh, moats, that are pricing power. Um, they tend to be smaller areas, where companies where we can have an edge. And those have largely been left out of the market over the last several years. Um, we saw a little bit of a, a, a rotation in the fourth quarter last year, that's been put on hold clearly as NVIDIA has taken all the air out of the room. Mm -hmm. But we do think that will resume um, is if we get a, a soft landing kind of scenario. Chris, we I read that quote from you earlier, just saying that, look, we're looking at companies that can reduce costs and increase output by using AI. Morgan Stanley had a piece out earlier in the month saying that companies are mentioning efficiency and AI together in one breath like they never have before. But how do you disaggregate what companies are actually doing that and those that are just using AI as an excuse to really try to hammer in on costs and let staff go? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question and, and something our analysts are focused on. It's, it's a question on almost every meeting that we have with companies. And, you know, we've had a few over the last few weeks where and I won't name the companies that are you know, using AI um, to do coding, to do content production, et cetera in areas where I'm focused on, and particularly in media. So, um, you know, this obviously was a big issue in the uh, actors and writers strikes that you uh, mentioned earlier is the source of some of Warner Brothers troubles. Uh, you know, it, it's gonna be used in very uh, game-changing ways. And our job is to figure out how that uh, impacts earnings. Chris, I feel like you were one breath away to being like, uh, Danny, I talked to your boss about it and you're about to lose a job because AI is going to be the next anchor of uh, the Open, which, you know, fair enough if it did happen. But I know you like live entertainment and sports, as you mentioned, and you've been talking clearly to companies. Again, I wish you'd tell me which one. But do they have it right yet? Do you think they have the mix right yet of getting AI to contribute to content? Because there are always, you know, people who say that they're going to use this new technology and get really bullish about it, and then it ends up not being there yet. Well, what, one of the reasons that we like live entertainment and sports is because it's very hard to replace um, those elements with AI. And, and there is still obviously a deep human need for contact, for being together. It's what, in part why you're seeing, you know, concert the concert business generally up 20% on other stock that uh, is doing quite well as Live Nation, which reported last night. Um, they're indicative of that as well as some of the other ones that we own, like The Sphere in Las Vegas, which has gotten a lot of attention. Again, human experiences, physical experiences, difficult to replicate. Uh, the secular trend that started before COVID has been accelerated by COVID and continues today. 
Do you think this market is, is too hypnotized by the flashy objective, not the tangible physical things, but by the tech companies? Yeah, there's always a shiny new thing, and, and clearly we've landed on the shiny new thing being AI, and, and we're in a hype stage. Uh, and at some point, then we'll get some retrenchment. That's probably the time to to make some investments um, for us. Um, but you know, we're again focused on companies that have been making products for for decades that are durable. Mm -hmm. And you know, Chris, as you're talking, there's a screen right next to you that shows the S and P at another intraday high. Nasdaq up four tenths of one percent. Small caps down two tenths of one percent. We saw a similar dynamic yesterday, where we saw the S and P 500 up by two percent, and the Nas and small caps not even up by 1%, just under it. You say that short term, there's gonna be rotation to small cap in value. Chris, I gotta be honest, I heard that at the end of 2023 also. What's different this time? Yeah, I, I don't know if I, I guess it depends on your definition of short term. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Clearly, uh, AI, large cap, mega cap is is winning the day, but eventually the, the value gap is just gonna be, is too great. Um, and you know, you've got the small cap stocks, the Russell 2000 in a bear market. Um, and um, it's been very rare that that's happened uh, alongside uh, the S&P uh, at all time highs. So um, you know, the, the value gap is just too great. And again, if we, could, if we see a soft landing kind of scenario and lower rates, those disproportionately help some of the more cyclical companies in the small cap indices and the companies that we're focused on. Chris, you also write that political risk is likely underpriced. This is something that a lot of people are trying to wrap their heads around. Do you need to have a portfolio that trades for Trump 2.0? What do you get ready to do if Red Sea continues to flare up? So what is this market missing? What is currently underpriced for political risk? Yeah, I, I, well, I think we'll probably see more volatility in the market as we get closer to the election in the U.S. Obviously, you've got the international dynamics and at least three major hotspots outside the US, but then we've got our own hotspots here. And um, you know, there are at least two elements. There's one, can we conduct a, a free and fair election in this country where we have a definitive winner on November 6th? And um, and then secondly, what are the policy implications from a, a change in occupant in the White House, if if that's the, what's gonna happen? And I'm not sure where the, uh, you know, wh where the market lands on that. Um, there are clearly some reasons to be bullish for Trump, probably more pro-growth, but some questions around um, uh, trade stance and just the overall stability of the economic and political system in this country. So um, all, all to be determined, the market hasn't really focused on it, probably will focus on it and more. And that's why we think there'll be more volatility, probably more opportunities to get into this market as we go through the year. Yeah, I guess if anything, you know, we're all looking to, to buy the dip with $6 trillion in, in cash at the moment. Chris, really appreciate your time. Enjoy your weekend. That's Chris Marenji. Now, coming up, Russia hit with significant sanctions. Important to remember that our objective remains the same, going after Russia's military industrialized complex and their ability to earn money to prop up their economy and buy the goods they need to fight the war they want. We'll have details on the targets and the implications next. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg's The Open. I'm Abigail Doolittle. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up next, our Glenn Fogel, Booking Holdings president and CEO, joins Bloomberg TV. That's at 10.30 a.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. Important to remember that our objective remains the same, going after Russia's military industrialized complex and their ability to earn money to prop up their economy and buy the goods they need to fight the war they want. What we're doing today is we are furthering those actions by going after companies in Russia that are helping to build military equipment. Today, Russia's running a wartime economy. Factories that used to produce goods for Russian civilians now are producing military equipment. We're sanctioning those companies, but we're also going after the companies that supply them in third countries in order to make clear to companies in third countries that you have a choice. You can do business with Russia and their military industrialized complex, or you can do business with the United States and our allies and partners who are joining us in this effort. The U.S. issuing a raft of sanctions against Russia following the death of opposition leader Alexei Navalny. Those include a military drone manufacturer, a payment system, and a 3D plastic printing company, as well as numerous others. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern joins us now for details on them. 
And Marie, how much of this is symbolic versus impactful? A lot of it is symbolic because you have to think the Russian economy already has a tremendous amount of sanctions on them. This has been levied throughout the past two years. We're coming up on what would be ne the next third year going into Russia's invasions of Ukraine starting tomorrow. But with the death of Alexei Navalny and on the anniversary of Putin's invasion, the U.S. is making a statement. So it's the biggest in terms of how many people and individuals, more than 500 in a single day. There's also TMK, which if you watch Russia is a well-known pipe producer. So some important names here, but you have to remember, of course, that what President Biden promised, which is that he'd turn the ruble into rubble and that he'd half the Russian economy, Putin hasn't been able to defy projections. The IMF has lifted Russia's growth prospects for this upcoming year. So yes, it's more sanctions, but will they work and change the trajectory of this war? No. What else can the U.S. do at this point when it comes to sanctions? Well, it's a great question. They can go after secondary sanctions, and potentially we might see some of that in this package. Um, so companies that are trading with Russia, that, that would go against U.S. sanctions. We've seen Europe want to take this path forward as well. Also, one part of the Russian economy that has been insulated for the most part, except in the United Kingdom, has been metals, aluminum and nickel. And we asked Wally Adiemo, the deputy treasury secretary about this during surveillance and he basically said wait and see so it does seem like that is potentially going to happen if you look at what's happening in the trading markets nickel and aluminum are higher so they also are expecting some sort of move from the west on going after those metals as well meanwhile over in dc we're about a week away from another government shutdown deadline Amory, how down to the wire does it look like it's going to get this time surprise surprise well they have about two <laughs> days to get it done if they want to hit that first deadline so the way speaker johnson was able to sell this to some of the members of his caucus who really don't uh really don't want to do deals with the democrats in terms of trying to get something over the finish line and are being hardliners on this he has two tranches so some parts of the government would shut down if they didn't come to an agreement March 1st and the rest would be March 8th. So you hear a lot of analysts talking about potentially there's a small shutdown on the 1st, but then they have this deadline of the 8th for remainder that they package everything in. They can also punt it. We've seen this game a lot in Washington, D.C. Just keep kicking it down the road, potentially another continuing resolution. The issue then is the Freedom Caucus members may say, uh, Speaker Johnson, we're going to go after your gavel the same way we went after Speaker McCarthy's if there's a continuing resolution or if he does a deal with the Democrats. Either way, he's going to have to do a deal with the Democrats to keep the government open or, uh, sh or, or, or shut into a continuing resolution or a continuing resolution. He, there's potential for him to lose his job in all of this. I mean, th those are literally so many different outcomes that might come from this Anne-Marie. Do you think that this kind of idea of having to break it up into two different deadlines, if it is punted, does it continue to look like that? It's getting increasingly messy if that's even possible. Yeah, we've seen this two deadline approach happen for the last few months. Every time there was a continuing resolution, they then punted it, but still had dual deadlines for some parts of the government agencies on the first date, some parts of the government agencies on the second date. So that I would expect to remain the same. The issue is they are getting very, uh, very close to the November election. So a lot of people are going to want to end primaries as well. So a lot of people are going to be hardened in their policies. So some of these votes may be difficult. Yeah, I hear there might be a primary this weekend, or there definitely will be. Anne-Marie, thank you so much. Anne-Marie Hordern. All right, for some of the sector price action this morning, let's get over to Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Hey, Abby. Hey, Danny. Well, we are looking at pretty uh, bullish sector composition. Most sectors are higher for the S&P 500, supporting that gain of about four-tenths of 1% up, up top. Uh, tech, NVIDIA, chips, uh, technology in general doing well, up about nine-tenths of 1%. To the downside, we do have energy, though. So let's stick with this sanction story down 1.5%, because one area that Russia has not uh, sanctioned, or the U.S. has not sanctioned against uh, Russia, as you were just mentioning, uh, oil or any of the other commodities. If you recall back in 2018, uh, strict sanctions were put against Rusal. At that time, aluminum spiked about 39% in a very short period of time. But right now, uh, the commodities uh, complex has not been sanctioned. It could be, as Anne-Marie was just talking about, but we can see Brent crude down 2%. The Select Spider uh, ETF that we were just looking at down 1.5%, the worst sector on the day. The overall Bloomberg Commodity Index down 1%. 
Uh, and then we have methanol futures, which uh, are up just a little bit relative to aluminum, which is not on this board, down about eight tenths of one percent. Copper down seven tenths of one percent. So it's going to be interesting to see in coming days, Danny, how this plays out, because right now investors in these commodities really not pricing in some sort of sanction activity against commodities. But as we know, that could change instantly. Yep, we've seen that before. Abby, thank you very much. Now, coming up, we're going to look at the market moving events you need to be watching. That's up next in our trading diary here on Bloomberg.